and welcome to Gwinnett County Public Library. My name is Amy Perry and I'm an adult services specialist with the library. Today's program, Creative Nonfiction and Poetry Writing Workshop, is presented by Christina Olson. Christina is the author of five books, most recently The Last Mastodon. Her work has appeared in Scientific American, The Atlantic, and The Best Creative Nonfiction, among many others. She teaches creative writing at Georgia Southern University. Please welcome Christina Olson. Hi. How's my sound? Doing all right? All right, cool. Um, <clears throat> so thank you all for coming out. You know, it's a kind of a gray Saturday, but I'm glad you're here. A couple things, uh, just to give you an overview of today. My plan is, what, what time are we done here? 12.45, 1? Yeah. Okay. Ish, yeah, okay. <laughs> um, so what I thought I would do is um, just talk a little bit at the beginning. Um, I've got a couple slides. I'm gonna talk <clears throat> kind of about how I came to write scientific fact into poetry and creative nonfiction, because it is certainly not a thing I thought I would ever do, let alone be known for. Um, and, uh, and talk you know, about my most recent work, which is kind of the best example of all this stuff. And then I thought we would, um, I have a big stack of packets for you all, so I thought we would look at some poems, um, other poets and, and, and nonfiction writers, and see how they navigate that, and talk a little bit about it, and then um, we would actually do a bunch of writing and share it. So a couple things, um, if you don't mind right now just checking to make sure your phone is like on silent, just so it doesn't blow up at any point. Um, but, and if there's anything that I say as I'm going through things, you know, I'm behind a podium, but, you know, please, like, just interrupt me or ask clarification or whatever it might be. Um, so, yeah. So, uh, so fancy. So this is me. Um, <laughs> and I'm sitting next to a Max the Mastodon. That's his actual skull. Uh, and I'll get into this in just a second. Um, but... Yeah, like I said, my, my, or as Amy said, my most recent book is actually all about Max, the Mastodon. Um, one of my students just showed up and like walked by. And now I think she's pretending that she knows where she's going, but she doesn't. Uh, she'll make it in, it'll be good. Um, so yes, this is me. Um, yep, this is, this is the book. Um, and so I thought, again, I would, I would kind of start by, by how I, I got to this point. Um, so when I was growing up, my dad was a geologist. I mean, he's, he's alive, he's living, but he's, he's retired. So he was a geologist. Um, and I really liked science when I was little. I mean, why wouldn't you? I'm sure many of you in here can relate to this. I mean, rocks are cool, fossils are cool, bugs are cool, right? Um, plants are kind of cool, right? Um, um, loved reading about dinosaurs. Uh, I was a big fan of this book by Roy Chapman Andrews, which was all about like mammoths and tar pits out in the, at La Brea. And, um, and yeah, to me, like, you know, it was a very scientific household. And, and I love that because to me, science was all about the why and also the how of things, um, which was pretty neat. Um, and then you know, I was really excited um, from elementary school into middle school to start taking those those big science classes that I'd heard so much about, earth science and biology and all that stuff. Um, <clears throat> and this would be the point where the ominous music starts playing and the narrator says, but it was in fact not going to be cool. So there's me. Um, this is <laughs> 1994. And I am stuck on my earth science homework yet again. So this is what we do every night. That's my dad, Cliff. Um, in case it's not super obvious, we live in Buffalo, New York. Hence all the Bills gear. I have no idea why we're dressed like this, but here we are. Yeah. <laughs> I don't even know. Like, I don't remember. I think we were just, we had moved to a town that had like a, a professional football team. And my parents were like, here you go. This is what you do. Um, and so I was just in a, in a moment where science was really hard. Um, and I had a dad who, who was obviously happy to sit with me, but his brain, this was a moment where I was like, your brain just is starting to work differently than mine. You know, this is, you can explain the concepts in a couple different ways. You can say them louder. You can say it slower, but there is something that is happening in my brain that is, 
that is not quite, you know, clicking, you know. And so, as I like to say, science and I broke up for a while. Um, I barely passed high school physics. Thankfully, I did not have to go to summer school. I ended up going uh, to college and majoring in interpersonal communication and then creative writing. Um, I did not think I would become a poet. I was pretty sure I was going to go into advertising, but you know, the world is funny this way. Um, but then a really strange thing happened. Not only did I become someone who liked to write about poetry or, um, and creative nonfiction, which I definitely didn't think that those two genres would be the thing I liked, um, but science started working its way back into my palms. You know, whether it was something to do with infectious diseases or whether it was a story about um, the gimpy gimpy plants, which is this plant in Australia that has these silica fibers that feel like glass when they embed under your skin. Um, you know, the natural world is deeply cool and also deeply terrifying. And it, these are things that were making their way into my palm. Um, and then I also became friends with Katie. Dr. Katie Smith, who is a paleontologist at Georgia Southern University, um, and she studies mastodons. And she'll be the first to tell you that a mastodon and a mammoth are different. Um, everyone thinks of the mammoths, they're the ones we always think of first, but mastodons are kind of like the, the dorky younger brother who's also kind of cool. Um, so Katie said, you know, I, I put on this conference out in Hemet, California, and I think you should come with me. And I was like, oh yeah, that'd be neat. And she said, no, I mean, I think you should be like the poet in residence. I said, have you ever had a poet in residence? She's like, no, but why not? You know, like, let's do it. So, um, yeah. Conway, you made it. Yeah, all good, take a seat. Just for you, I'll go back to this picture of me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> yeah, so in 2017, Katie said, you know, yeah, why don't you come out? Um, I'm going to put on this conference. Uh, Hemet, California is the home of the Western Science Center. It's basically built around Max the Mastodon. He's the largest mastodon that they've ever found west of the Mississippi. At the time, he was classified as an American mastodon. As a result of this conference, they actually came up with um, a new designation, and now he's a Pacific Mastodon. Um, I had nothing to do with that, but it feels cool to be in the room where it happens, to quote Hamilton. Um, so yeah, I went. Um, it was a three-day conference in August 2017 out in Hemet, California, which is Inland Empire, so about an hour and a half inland from Los Angeles. Very hot, very dry. Um, and then, yeah, you can see right there. So. They've got a couple, it's not a large museum, but it, they have a couple really neat displays. Um, right here, this dude in the back, this is Paramylodon, so basically a giant ground sloth. Um, and then this is um, Xena, who is a mammoth. Xena was originally classified as a male, um, but now they know that she was female. And the scale is a little off, um, but Xena is much larger than Max. And then this is Max here. And then this is actually Xena's skull in glass. And then this is Max's skull in glass. So <clears throat> yeah, so I walk into this room. Um, and you know, basically, I was there with not only my friend Katie, but also about 13 other paleontologists um, from around the world. And I mean, this is what they do. They study mastodons. And there's not a lot of them. and they're obviously really dedicated. And so we walked into this museum um, and they got right to work. I mean, like it was like, hi, how are you doing? And then the next thing I know, I look down and there's these, there's a mastodon named Little Stevie and he's, his bones are on the floor. And like Katie just like opens the case and like sticks her head in, right? And I was like, oh boy, um, which was really neat. But also as like the writer of the group, I was just kind of standing there. Um, doing that thing where you pretend you know what's going on, but you actually don't, right? Um, so it took me a little bit to get my bearings, um, but eventually, you know, I just kind of got right into it. Um, I was afraid to touch things because I'm also a very clumsy person, and the paleontologists were like, look, this stuff was in the ground for 15,000 years. Unless you like hit it with a really big hammer, it's going to be fine. So this is, you know, me finally working up the courage to touch a mammoth molar, um, about that big. You can see my hands. Um, yeah, and it was an incredibly amazing experience. And so, 
kind of thinking about science and how it relates to writing, um, some takeaways I had was, you know, science is about asking questions, which is just what poetry and, and creative nonfiction do. Um, science is also about being curious and willing to fail. You know, as someone who, again, had some pretty <laughs> traumatic experiences of failing uh, science courses, it was really refreshing to be around paleontologists. And I would say, why is it? And they were like, oh, we have no idea. Like, we're going to figure it out, but we really have no idea. Um, they were very forthcoming. They were very quick to say, like, here's our hypothesis. This was wrong, you know, scientific methods, all like that. Um, this third thing was really important to me. I come from... You know, I think a, a background, um, and this is a total false dichotomy, and I, I wish I hadn't existed in it for so long, but, you know, I, I, again, I've got a brother who's an engineer, I've got a dad who's a geologist, it was like, these are my STEM people, and here's the humanities people, right? And so it felt very artificially siloed. Um, and I teach now at a university, and, and that's one of the, I think, unfortunate rhetorics that continues to happen, right? It's like, you're a humanities major or you're a STEM person, but of course that's, that's not at all true. Um, and scientists are writers, and writers have elements of science in them. And, and these things aren't off limits to you, right? Um, and again, I come from poetry. Um, and so usually if I'm like on a bus or um, you know, talking to a dental hygienist, they'll ask what I teach. And I say, I teach poetry. And they always are like, ah. Uh, and I'm like, it, Nine out of ten people, I'm like, it's okay, you can tell me that you hate poetry. <laughs> it's fine, you know. Um, I did too, right, when I first started. Um, it was just uh, something that I didn't know much about. Um, and then this sounds so obvious that it's almost embarrassing, but, you know, my time out there also reminded me that scientists are real people. You know, they're not just like poets are real people, you know. Like, all of us are just kind of moving through the world and, and taking notes and things. Um, I have a, a handout that I'm going to give you all, kind of thinking about some of the functions. And I'm just going to work off this first page. What's great is that, um, can you pass these two back? Look at that, I got them all right. What's great is that if you look at the first page, there's four functions, and then I'm going to show you a slide with five. <laughs> so uh, what can I say? Scientific method, let's always be updating things and testing our hypothesis. <clears throat> so here are what I call like the Olson five functions of how we can use scientific fact. And I say poetry here, but created on fiction, and fiction for that matter, too. So, yeah, one of them you'll need to, to add to your handout. Um, and we'll talk much more about them in a little bit. We can look at some of those poems and those packets and maybe see how these things are at work. So first things first, um, scientific fact gives us surprising or unexpected diction and syntax in a poem. Um, and I think, you know, for those of you who are practicing writers, you know that we all have words that we really love. And of course, like our vocabulary as a writer is really important because it's what gives us our voice. It's what gives us our style. Um, but it also means that sometimes we're fond of using the same word over and over and over. Um, anyone have like their favorite word that they are always writing? What is it? Salvation. Yeah. Yeah. Important, important concept, right? Yeah. I went through a phase where I was putting together a manuscript and then I realized that like every other poem had like a bird in it, like, and, and usually a dark bird, you know? And I was like, all right, I gotta, I gotta fix this, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so scientific fact, you know, in a really basic way gives us that unexpected diction or syntax, right? Suddenly we get to start throwing around words like, you know, Holocene or xylem, right? Um, and so it's a way for us to to kind of shake up the vocabulary as we're working on these things. This is important to me. I don't know how you'll feel about it, but my second point is that um, scientific fact actually gives us perspective on a geological time scale. Um, again, I grew up in a house with a geologist, so I think I don't know that every family spends a lot of time at the dinner table talking about like mass extinction events, but we did, right? Um, 
which was both humbling and also like deeply terrifying sometimes because all I was trying to do is like survive eighth grade and then my dad needs to tell me about like a crater, you know, <laughs> and how Yellowstone's gonna blow up one day. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, I think one of the things that happens is um, as poets and writers, of course our art starts with us, but it can also be almost solacistic, solacistic after a while. Um, when you just find yourself, you know, writing only about yourself. And so science is a place where we get to look outside of ourselves. You know, and don't get me wrong, I love a good, a good navel gaze. I mean, who doesn't, right? But, but it is, I think, really important sometimes to just kind of look up and be reminded that the, there's something else going on, right? Um, and I think a, a lot of times our work is better for it because it's not just this constant examination of, of ourselves and our experience, but rather, you know, science gives us a place to kind of open up and then go into different places. My third note is that uh, science, I think, gives us a lens and the poem can then view something else. And so what I mean by that is, um, this is gonna be a very revealing anecdote, but that's fine. Uh, <clears throat> For years, I tried to write a love poem for my husband. I mean, he deserves many more, but I was like, let me get a good one, you know? Um, and every time I sat down to write it, it was just, it was hard because it felt trite, you know? I mean, like, the things I could say were important, but as far as the poem, they felt cliched, right? I mean, we know this is how this stuff goes. And so what I ended up doing instead is, writing what I thought was a love poem, but it actually ended up being about the honeybee thermal defense, which is what happens when a hornet attacks a, a honeybee or a nest of honeybees. And, uh, and the hive will actually swarm the hornet. Um, and what they'll do is they'll vibrate and it will increase the temperature of the nest and it will also put out a bunch of carbon monoxide and that's what kills the hornet. So a couple honeybees die, but you know, it's in the name of, of the, the, the safety of the, of the swarm. Um, and then I was very proud of myself and I was like, here's this love poem, <laughs> you know, but it's actually about dead bees, like hope that's okay. Um, but I, I, you know, for me, like that was kind of the lens, that was my entry point. For some reason, the way my brain was working, that was, that's what let me kind of like, open up because then I was thinking, what it reminded me of is, is a time that he and I were at a, we were seeing a band and we were down on the floor um, and there were just like a couple really, really drunk guys who were doing bad things. And it was kind of interesting to watch the crowd kind of like, um, kind of manage these people, right? Um, and so I thought like, oh, the bees and then this and then um, my husband kind of like <laughs> picked up one of the guys and like took him outside um, and then just like released him. I don't mean to be like, he, he beat them up or anything. He's a very nice guy. Um, but, uh, but again, you know, that was kind of the lens. That was the entry point. Um, yeah, and scientific fact also gives you a place to pivot, which is kind of related. So again, you know, maybe, maybe you're starting to write that poem and it feels like it's a really linear narrative. Well, one of the dangers I think of a, a super linear narrative is, you know, a poem should have some surprise in it, right? Robert Frost famously said that if there's no surprise for you as a writer who's writing the poem, there's not gonna be any surprise for, you, for the reader of your poem, right? Otherwise, it feels like you're just kind of checking off the boxes. And so scientific fact sometimes gives you a spot where you can, you can leap out or you can start talking about honeybees <laughs> instead of, you know, your feelings. Um, yeah. And then finally, last but not least, I mean, scientific fact is cool. I mean, it, there's just cool things. I, I'm sure we all have a factoid that's rattling around in our heads and you're just, you're just waiting to write about it and you're not sure where it's gonna come up, but you know it will come up somehow. Um, and one of the great things I think about, one of the pleasures of reading poetry is that a poem is gonna, is gonna teach you something you didn't know that you wanted to know, right? Um, but that's one of the, you know, the, the great things. And it's the same with creative nonfiction. We can all read, scientific articles, but if we read a lyric essay, right, that kind of weaves that stuff in, then it tells us something, you know, quite different. I'm gonna read um, two pieces. They're short. <laughs> um, I didn't put page numbers on this packet and I apologize for that. But if you flip to the very last couple pages, 
you'll see something that looks like this. I included a couple PDF proofs from this Mastodon book for you. And this is a chat book, and it's, it's mostly poetry, but there's a couple longer pieces that are flash creative nonfiction, sort of like these, these they're somewhere between prose poems and, and you know, short creative nonfiction. Mm. Sorry, that was hideously loud. Um, yeah. So if you flip, I'm just going to go to the one that says catalog of damages. <coughs> Um, and I've put this image up here, again, of, of Xena's molar. And so remember, Xena was a mammoth. And so her teeth look really different um, than Max the Mastodon's teeth. It's one of the, the major ways you can tell them apart. Um, and so a, a Mastodon tooth is um, kind of, I don't have a marker, but it, it Mastodon comes from <laughs> breast tooth. Um, Georges Cuvier in the 18th century was regarding this mastodon molar and um, I think it looks like mountains but he looked at it and thought like a human breast so sure um, but it's really jagged versus you know something that's really flat like this mammoth molar um, so this is the first poem catalog of damages all these years not knowing the difference between mammoth and mastodon just another human so proud in her indifference. But it's in the teeth. Mammoth teeth resemble the rubber sole of a snow boot. Mastodon teeth, jagged mountains turned to granite after all these years. Jefferson thought the West still crawled with mastodons, sent Lewis and Clark to thin the herd. All morning, I've tried to reconcile our ambition with the misery it brings what we set out to do, and what disaster ensues. 11 foot at the shoulder, Max is the largest mastodon in the West. Jefferson owned Sally Hemings. I never could make small talk with my father. I told you this was a catalog of damages. Oh God, the mouth is such a weapon. Um, so again, you know, there's, there's obviously some scientific fact in there, but Thomas Jefferson shows up at one point, didn't know that was going to happen until I sat down to write the poem. Um, my dad and I are not super close these days, so I didn't think he was going to work his way into the poem, but then of course he did, you know. So if we're thinking about those, those functions, kind of like the lens or the pivot point, um, yeah. So that's kind of how those show up. Anyone here been to La Brea? out in LA. It's cool. It smells like asphalt because it's tar bubbling up from the ground. It's like right in central Los Angeles. Um, obviously Los Angeles has grown up around it. Um, and it's a working site. Um, 365 days a year there's paleontologists um, there. There's a really cool museum from the 50s. Um, and so these are so a lot of people think that dire wolves were like made up for Game of Thrones, but they are they were in fact a, an actual thing. Um, and so uh, um, these are some of the skulls that they've pulled out. And so they're they're on display at the museum. And um, I just kind of give you a close up so you can see them in profile. But I mean, like it's like a wall from from there to there, and it's like all these skulls, and they're all backlit in orange, and they're really neat. Um, and so this next short nonfiction piece um, is about that. It's called Animals Doing Things to Other Animals. In the Page Museum at La Brea Tar Pits in California, the skulls of wolves glow orange. Their sheer number is difficult to comprehend. The most populous specimen found at La Brea is not mastodon, but dire wolf. 4,000 skulls and fragments pulled free from tar. Jefferson owned more than 600 slaves during his lifetime. He freed 10. Bones from a tar pit are stained brown. Two of the freed were the children Jefferson had with Sally Hemings. Hemings negotiated this in exchange for returning to Virginia from France. She was 16. Madison and Eston were freed upon Jefferson's death. Beverly and Harriet disappeared, or rather, they passed. The scientists at the pit work 361 days a year. 
At Monticello, 600 men, women, children worked 365 days a year. La Brea means the tar in Spanish. So to say the La Brea tar pits is to say the the tar tar pits. It is a stutter, a tripped tongue. Sometimes visitors to La Brea mistake the scientists for actors or for robots. A certain type of tourist mistakes industry for theater. Stutter, involuntary sound repetition, but also hesitation or pausing. I meant, of course, they passed as white. To say black people were enslaved is redundancy. Of course they were black, mulatto, quadroon. One drop is all it takes. The brain cannot comprehend some things, and thus we stutter. Sally Hemings was Martha Jefferson's half-sister. Jefferson never remarried after Martha's death at age 33. In one version of the truth, Jefferson did not remarry because he loved Martha and honored her deathbed promise. But this is also true. He didn't need to remarry. He had Sally. A stutter hangs awkwardly, the sound sticking in the mouth. Jefferson, of course, is thought to have stuttered. The fields surrounding Monticello are green and brown and black. In the winter, they sometimes freeze. At La Brea, it smells of asphalt. A thick bubble inflates, then pops. I wish I could call my father, tell him where I stand. I watch a boy captivated by the bubble. He is standing next to a life-size model of a ground sloth. Around him are the bones of condors, saber-toothed tigers, an army of wolves. But they are dead, and thus hard to understand. They are a concept. The bubble, though, is real. He sees himself in its darkness. What do we do now, my country? The situation grows dire. A tar pit is a black trap, but it also supports life, bacteria, extremophiles. Under the harshest conditions, something endures. So again, I didn't realize when I set out to write this book that it was actually going to be like half a meditation on, on Thomas Jefferson. Um, that problematic person, and also, you know, a meditation on my dad. Um, I thought I was just going to write a book about mastodons, but here we are. So just to, to wrap this up, and then let's look at some poems. Um, so a couple of rules that I set for myself that you may or may not find helpful. You get to do you as we write today. Um, I think a lot of times when we think of poetry, we think that nature is going to show up. Um, but I like to draw maybe a distinction in language between nature and scientific fact. So you'll hear me kind of use them um, in different ways. Um, I think nature appears in poetry often, but it can also be manipulated into serving a function that the poet wants. Um, you know, so for example, humans are really good at projecting our human stuff onto like animals, right? So like you'll walk outside and you'll see a bird and you're like, that bird's having a bad day. It's like, no, that bird is fine. I mean, <laughs> you know, this is called projection, Christina, um, you know. But again, we tend to view everything through a very human lens. Um, and sometimes when nature shows up in poems, I think sometimes poets are sort of using it in this very human way. And so I like to think about scientific fact as being a little more, a little more rigid, um, which sounds like it would be constrictive, but oftentimes our, our best ideas come when we have like some sort of framework, you know, something that we're kind of pushing against. Um, so I always say that scientific fact in our poems and, and nonfiction should function differently. It should be objectively accurate, right? Um, <clears throat> my thing was also I didn't want to embarrass myself in front of all these paleontologists I had met, right? <laughs> um, and so I was, I was really careful to make sure that um, I got the facts right. Um, and then my rule for myself became, you know, I shouldn't subvert the scientific fact for the truth, right? They can coexist. Um, and then the really nice thing is that when I was in doubt of anything, I could just text my friend Katie. Um, and actually, this entire experience got me into Twitter. I used to think Twitter was a flaming dumpster, and it kind of is. But um, there's this this science Twitter that's really neat, you know. So um, yeah, and I'll I'll throw up a couple links at the end here. So all right, let's look at some poems. I've been talking a bunch, and I'm going to get away from this podium here in a second. But if you go back to the first page, past the functions, the very first poem I gave you is um, 
from this really amazing poet who happened to be my undergrad professor. That's more of a brag than anything. Um, named Amy Um And she, she writes poems that are all about the natural world. And then um, she just put out this really cool book. Uh, it was actually like Barnes and Noble's book of the year last year um, called World of Wonder. And it's these, these short creative nonfiction pieces. Um, does anyone want, we won't necessarily read all of them this way, but I'd like to hear a couple of these. Can I get anyone feeling brave enough to volunteer to read Amy's poem this morning? It's a cold read, I know, so yeah, go for it. Mr. Kloss and the Crustaceans. Whales the color of milk have washed ashore in Germany, their stomachs clogged full of plastic and car parts. Imagine a creature half as big a football field. The magnificence of the largest brain of any animal, modern or extinct. I've been trying to locate my fourth grade science teacher for years, Mr. Kloss, who gave us each a crawfish he found just past the suburbs of Phoenix before strip malls licked every good desert with a cold blast of freon and glass. Mr. Kloss, who played soccer with us at recess, who let me observe my snappy crawfish in the plastic blue pool before class started. I'd place my face to the surface of the water and check if it's, if it's still skittered alive. I hate to admit how much this meant to me, the only brown girl in the classroom. How I wish I could tell him how I've never stopped checking the waters, the ponds, the lakes, the sea. And I worry because I've yet to see a sperm whale, except when they beach themselves in coves. How many songs must we hear from the sun-bleached bones of a seabird or a whale. If there was anyone on earth who would know this, Mr. Quas, it's you. Even bottle caps found inside an albatross corpse can make a tiny ribcage whistle when the ocean wind blows through it just right. I know wherever you are, you'd weep if you heard this sad music. You first taught us kids how to listen to water. I'm grateful for each story in its song. Great reading, thank you. Um, so take another minute and reread it, and I'll put these back up. Um, and then I'd like us to maybe just to kind of start picking this poem apart and, and talking about some of the ways that we see Nozuka Mutado, um we can call her Amy, um, using scientific fact. So let's maybe take like three minutes. One of the things I love about teaching poetry is we get to kind of talk out how a poem works trademark. Um, so what are y'all seeing at work in this poem? What are some of the observations that you have? Description of the magnificence of a whale. Yeah, and th that word, right, that she uses, the magnificence of it, right? Um, I've never been, I don't know if any of you have, like, seen a whale in person, anyone? I have not. It, yeah? You're like, no big deal. <laughs> You know, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. So you know, the poem is sort of located in the beginning um, with like just the sheer magnitude, right? Which it kind of becomes both um, <clears throat> the fact is there in just the size, and then of course it's also kind of uh, literally. So then it's also of course figuratively because we're also talking about you know the scale of something else that's going on, right? Yeah, good. Some other things. What else? We can just, like, it doesn't have to be about the science necessarily. We can just start taking apart the, the words and the lines. What are some of the images or descriptions that were really jumping out at you? Or really helped you maybe kind of understand that magnificence? Yeah. And how Amy's able to describe that it makes sounds and the song that comes out of it and that's beautiful. Yeah, I mean it's it's like horrifyingly beautiful, right? You know, you have this whale that 
Yeah. And again, I mean, it's not, <clears throat> you know, the scientific fact is that the whales are washing ashore and they have like these guts full of car parts, right? But then I think it takes like a, a writer to look at it and be like, this is depressing, but also like there's this song that plays over the rib cage, you know, this little haunting melody. Yeah. Some other things? I mean, it's a poem full of like little to big horrors. Like obviously we're talking about the beached and decaying animals, but I mean, even just the thought of the desert being eaten up by the suburbs is in itself horrifying in a really capitalistic way. Um, Political, I like it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And then, I mean, there's also like this this real loss too, because she can't find the fourth grade teacher anymore, right? You can think about us for a little, Crawfish. Yeah, whether it's a crawfish or a crawdad or crawdad or mud bug, these will all re reflect your dialect. Yeah, yeah, um, but yeah, yeah. And then of course, almost the the almost offhanded, but of course very significant fact where she's like, "This really meant a lot to me," you know, because I was like, <clears throat> Amy is um, Filipino and and um, Indian. Um, and she's like, yeah, I was the only brown kid in the class, you know, and and I would go look at my, my crawfish, you know, yeah, yeah. And the time scale was in the sun-bleached bones and the encroaching city. Yes. In her growing up. Right. And I mean, Phoenix is massive and keeps growing, you know, like many of our metropolises, um, yeah. But even the way she just kind of says, like, licked every good desert, right? Um, and I love what she does there, too, because if your eye blinks over it, it almost, you know, it almost reads as dessert, right? And then, of course, like, and she knows that. I mean, like, that's what a poet does, right? Like, they, they think about all these, these words, and we just sit at our desks and take all the commas and move them around and then think about these things. Yeah. It's sort of an ode to her teacher, too. A lot of times, you know, we don't really realize, uh, teachers don't really realize you know, what impact they have on their students. And it takes a student to reflect on that later on, you know, to, to tell you how much, you know, that, that uh, lesson meant. I know. <clears throat> I teach college, and I always want there to be, like, a 10-year student evaluation. Like, I just want, you know, uh, and it's, it would be okay with me if my students were like, I have no recollection of taking that person's class. That'd be fine, because at least it means I didn't do any damage, right? <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, it, it's funny, isn't it? Like the things that we kind of pick up and carry with us, right? Like for her, it's like this, and it's it's so interesting, you know, to to think about this poem because it's it's kind of an elegy and it's also an ode to Mr. Kloss, and it's you know it's kind of like her origin story, right? We can see that like this is where kind of her, her love from this, this science comes from. And yet the poem is also, you know, doing those things and then also teaching us some, some depressing but also true facts about what's going on with the whales, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, let's do this. There's a bunch of poems in here and I don't expect you to be able to read them all right now, but I'd like a, you know, just, just turn to one. Um, go find a different one. There's. You know, if you're into scorpions, there's a really great one by Bridget Pegeen Kelly. Um, if you're into inseminating elephants, Lucia Perillo has a good one. Uh, Camille Dungy's talking about gray wolves. There's one from Annalise Gelman that's about the um, There's a really cool one from Oliver de la Paz. He actually takes an autism screening questionnaire that a doctor gave his, his child, um, and the questions are intact, but then De La Paz, you know, kind of writes these answers in poetry. There's one, um, if you remember the biosphere at all, I'm kind of aging myself, but yeah, there's one, Alison Hawthorne Deming has one about uh, the biosphere, and then the very last one, before you get to the ones I read for you, um, is kind of this long prose poem slash flash career of nonfiction. So I know this is quick, but let's just maybe take like seven minutes and just turn to one, see what catches your eye, and then I'd love for us to be able to come back and, and talk about one more, and then we'll get into writing our own stuff. I'd love to talk about maybe two of these, and then we can kind of use it as our warm-up period and get into our own things. And all these authors, I, I wanted to give you a packet where a bunch of different authors, lots of different styles and topics, and all kind of doing different things. Um, but uh, does anyone have one that they'd really, 
they want to talk about? I did the one specimens collected at the clear cut. Yeah, okay. So Alison Hawthorne Deming, this is like, if you haven't read Deming, this is very much what she does. Um, and this one's a bit longer. So, how do you feel? You want to read it? You want to, yeah, yeah. Or if you want, you and I can alternate sections because it's a, sure, okay, start us off. Wild current twig flowering with a cluster of rosy micro goblets. Wild iris, its three landing platforms, purple bleeding to white, then yellow in the honey hollows, purple vein showing the directions to the sweet spot. Dogwood, not what I know from the northeast woods, the white four petaled blossoms marked with four rusty holes that make it shaped and demonic for Christ hanging on the cross. This one, six petaled, larger, whiter, domed seed house in the center. No holes on the edges, shameless heathen of the Northwest Forest that flaunts its status as exhibitionist for today. Empty tortilla chip bag. Empty rolling rock can, empty Mountain Dew bottle, empty shotgun shell, beer bottle busted by shotgun shell, blasted bullseye hanging on an alder sapling. One large bruise, four inches below right knee, inflicted by old growth stump of western red cedar, a scent attempted through, though the relic was taller and wider than me, debris fields skirting a meter high at its base, wet and punky. Nonetheless, I made my try, eyes on a block of sodden wood, reddened by rain, fragrant as a cedar closet here in the open air. The block of my interest wormed through, pecked through? with tunnels, diameter of a pencil. How many decades, how many centuries of damage and invasion the tree had survived? But the stump felled me, left me with its stake on my claim and jubilation to see that nothing of this ruin was mine. Mine only the lesson that the forest has one rule, start over making use of what remains. One hunk of dead fir, tree, fir gray as driftwood, length of my forearm, width of my hand, Wood grain deformed into swirls, eddies, backflows, and cresting waves, a measure of time, disturbances that interrupted linear growth to make it liquid as stream flow. Lettuce lung, Loberia pulmaria, leaf lichen, upper side dull green, turns bright green in rain, lobed, ridge surface with powdery warts, underside tan and hairy with bald spots, Texture like alligator skin. Sample attached to twig falls at my feet on trail to Lookout Creek. Day five, resampling the site, TID. Four metaphors for the forest. Plantation trees, herringbow tweed. Old growth tree, medieval brocade. Clear cut, the broken loom. Clear cut five years later, patches on the torn knees of jeans. Scat. Pellets the size of atomic fireballs. Hot candy I loved as a child. This, more oval. Less round, not red, but brown. Specimen dropped by Roosevelt elk, savoring the clear cuts menu of mixed baby greens. One pellet broken open to reveal golden particles. Light that traveled from sun to grass to gut to ground to mind. Forest time makes everything round, everything broken, a story of the whole. That is probably the nicest description of scat you're ever going to read. <laughs> so what was it about this one that drew you in? It was so visual. Yeah. And I really liked the, the different diction, like the herringbone tweed and, and things like that. And I love that twice it talked about that the forest starts over making use of what remains. And that last one, 10, really showed that with the light that traveled from sun to grass to gut to ground to mine. Yeah. I love too how she's so good at, at taking these massive things, right? And again, if we're thinking about like that geological perspective, I mean, it's, it's huge. And then she's so good at kind of like, okay, what's the really precise thing I can zoom in on that will be like, help me as a human make sense of all this? And like, where am I located in it? Where's like the tortilla chip bag located in it? Where's the lichen in it? Where's the elk in it? And then, <laughs> No big deal, the sun is light coming, you know, 93 million miles from Earth or whatever it is, just to, like for this moment to illuminate this um, poop on the ground. <laughs> I like the, just the descriptiveness of the words that she used 
And I also like the familiarity, like instead of Douglas fur, it was Doug. I know. So, yeah, yeah. And again, I mean, I think, um, you know, a pastoral poem, this is a pastoral, but when we think of pastoral, we think of like the poems from the 19th century where, you know, someone's in a field and they're waxing poetic. And this is, this is much more of that catalog, you know, even in the title, it's specimens collected. So we feel like that, that uh, indifference isn't the word, but it's just objective. Um, the other thing that I love too is that the forest has been clear cut, you know, um, and it's filled with garbage human garbage, but there's no commentary in the poem. It's presented without commentary, right? Because she knows that, kind of like when we were looking at Amy's poem, I mean, the fact, like she trusts the reader to, to be able to make up their own mind about whether or not this is a good thing, right? So it, the poem is not lecturing you. The poem is presenting things, yeah. Some other lines that maybe other folks caught in this one or some of the things, she does some really cool things with syntax. Um, so I don't know if there's a, a section that maybe kind of drew you in. Yeah, the lettuce long. Entire section, like it starts with the uh, the alliteration to kind of like mm -hmm. force you to slow down and really like picture this lichen, which is not necessarily the most attractive thing in the world, but you sit there and you really contemplate it, and you're like, oh, I'm right there with you, Allison. Like I see that. <laughs> Uh, yeah, and again, it's like she, you know, she's, she's, you know, give us the the litany of what this thing is, right? What does it look like on the top? What does it look like on the bottom? Like, what are the, the warts? Aren't just warts; they're powdery warts, right? You know. But again, it's kind of like that whole list. And then she also like, I love how she goes from from her friend Doug Fur, but then also drops like the scientific name of the of the lichen, right? <laughs> um, yeah, one of the other really cool things when you're working with um, scientific fact in poems is it really shows your readers like who you are as a person because the things that you find interesting, right, are kind of revealing. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then you know, it's also is it a is it a is it a flash creative nonfiction essay? Is it a long prose poem? I don't know. I don't know what you would call it. Um, but you know, the form, right? Um, one of the, the things I think here is, you know, students will sometimes ask me like, what makes it a prose poem besides the fact that it doesn't have line breaks? And I think, you know, you have to think about the relationship between form and content. Like she's giving us so much content here, this form makes sense. I think if you tried to put line breaks in this between, <laughs> some of you just like shook your head. You were like, no, <laughs> right? Um, but yeah, it would be kind of almost like a, a, a bridge too far. Like she's giving you so much information, um, you know, a lot of times she's setting up things in a list or she's giving you like, you know, these, these um, things that are linked with just the colons. And I think if we were also trying to then navigate like a line break, it would probably break our, strain our brains a little bit, you know. Good. Give me another one. What do you think? What's up? Oh yeah, okay. So let's go back a couple pages to Annalise Gelman's. I don't even know how you would pronounce the title of this. It's just this thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, Hannah, let's hear it. I couldn't remember whether the chambers of the heart were atria or ventricles. I looked it up, they're both. The atrium brings the blood in, gestures to the coat rack, pours a glass of red wine, then out through the so swollen, sodden gills, lub dub, all best to the wife and kids. Missing you, there's some muscle I can't untense. It's not even a vagina muscle, it's my heart. I was thinking the heart's chambers were made of cells, which are made of chambers, but then I remembered muscle cells are really more like those rolls of cookie dough you slice and throw in the oven, discrete strands. Maybe string cheese would have been a better metaphor, but it's too late now. I've already made it about cookies. If you don't like cookies, then you're not paying attention. It turns out heart cells aren't even like normal muscle cells. They've only got one nucleus, and they spend their lives making sure they keep it living. Under duress, their walls thicken. I'm pretty sure someone grew them in a petri dish, and all the cells began to beat in synchrony, the tiniest dubstep concert ever. Cardiomyocytes can grow once, but, if, but once they die, you're totally screwed. I didn't even want to drop the name cardiomyocyte. There's a joke about monogamy in all of this somewhere. I will find it. 
I'll tell it to you and you'll laugh and I'll keep tensing up my heart because if I don't, I'll die and this love poem will have been for nothing. So super different tonally. Um, yeah. What are, your, what are your notes and observations, Conway? Um, the thing I liked the most was this like weird like subversion of the idea of like a heartbeat where she's like, I keep tensing it up and it's like, well, yes, that's what it does. Like, One hopes. Yeah, yeah. Right, yeah. It's funny because... It's almost, she's describing it more as like physical tension at first, where she's like, I can't untense. But then at the end we see it's like, I'll keep tensing at my heart because like you're keeping it beating kind of thing. Yeah. It's a nice picture. It's also weird. And I like it. <laughs> it is. One of the things I love about this speaker is that the speaker of this poem keeps saying something and then like walks it back, right? And of course, like the speaker has access to like the backspace key, right? So it's, you know. Um, I love that moment where, where the speaker says, maybe string cheese would have been a better metaphor, but it's too late now. I've already made it about cookies, right? I mean, but then this is the same speaker that then like casually drops cardiomyocyte like a stanza later. And I, you know, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a good case study in voice, you know? Um, and again, kind of thinking about like the way that you can kind of drop these facts into a poem and then suddenly your reader is like, oh, I guess... We went from cookies to string cheese to cardiomyocytes to like this this fact about the nucleus, right, of a heart cell. Yeah. Um, other things that you might notice? I mean, I think based with like the tone, mm -hmm. the title is just perfect because like I don't know, it, it feels like a really like smart kid in like one of those really awkward like high school romances where like you feel like it's so big and important. It's the most like important romance you're ever gonna have in your life. It's like, shut up, you're just a kid. But you know, it's like they're also a really intelligent person because you're getting like this really clear imagery, but like I guess it does kind of look like string cheese and a muscle cell does look like cookie dough because like all the little chocolate chips are like the nuclei of the cell and it paints a really clear picture while still being scientifically accurate. And it just, it makes me think of like a very young speaker. And then the title does a lot of that work to set the tone anyways. Yeah, there's kind of, um, <clears throat> there's an interesting tension, right, to the poem, right? Like a, a good poem is all about tension, right? Whether that's through line breaks or whether it's through, in this case, I think like some of the tension is coming from, um, you know, the, the, the scientific fact kind of, brushing up against like string cheese right <laughs> or to, I didn't want to make this a love poem you know but here I am right kind of like that that speaker who seemingly is hesitant but then also knows exactly what they want to say right you know kind of the way that we talk things out and then in talking them out we find the language for the thing and then we like well I mean I, I say this like we but you know if you're a if you're a verbal processor right like you're familiar with this so yeah I think it's interesting that she says, I don't want to make this a love poem, but it's a poem about the heart. Right. It's like also aware, you know, like the speaker is kind of like this self-aware, like I know, you know, this could be like a cliche, right? Which I know that I think, <laughs> I love the title. It's like, let's just throw the emoticon heart on here and be done with it. You know, like, I don't want to come up with some other title. Like it is what it is, right? I also love when the speaker says, there's a joke about monogamy in all this um, somewhere. I will find it, right? But then like, so it's like, naming the thing without actually defining the thing or doing the thing, um, which is a way to bring something in, right? Yeah. I really like how she casually throws in, I'm pretty sure someone grew them in a Petri dish and all the cells began to beat in synchrony. It's like, this is clearly something you know to have happened, otherwise you would have never imagined this situation. But yeah. also how that, I don't know, it's just this like little it micro. Down the line. Well, I was going to say it's more of like a micro metaphor for the entire piece of it's like, and then they all grew and now they're together and beating in unison. And if they stop, we all die. So yeah. that's yeah. love. There you go. And also human existence. <laughs> right. Yeah. 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 Uh, I mean, I just, there's something about a speaker. Cardiomyocytes can grow, but once they die, you're totally screwed. Right. You know, I mean, like, just think about the, the contrast in diction there. Right. Like the, the big vocab word of cardiomyocyte. And then, of course, like screwed right you know um and then, the dubstep concert ever cardiomyocytes yeah 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 um 
And I love it too, you know, because again, it's like a different way to have the speaker write a love poem. I mean, like, love poems are hard and, you know, but, um, but necessary. But also it's so easy to tip into cliche territory. And this poem, you see that speaker like navigating so expertly around all that stuff. Um, and then all of a sudden we've got like string cheese and cookies showing up, so. If you go to the very, very last page. Let's write. Okay, so I've given you five facts. These are as true as the internet tells me they are. So if anyone here is a subject matter expert and you'd like to quibble, I gave you the links so that you can go fight with other people on the internet. Um, so I have these, these, these five quote unquote weird factoids. Um, one's about this idea that I would say in English at least or in as far as we know, blue is one of the very last colors that we, we named. And there was a scholar who basically figured this out in reading translations um, of the Odyssey when the sea was never described as blue, but actually it was, it was described as um, wine dark. Honey was called green and all this other stuff. Um, the second one is about these sailing stones that take place, or they, they exist in Death Valley. Um, and they're basically these rocks, um, and they're all different sizes, but they, they move. Um, and then I gave you kind of like the, the rundown. Well, I stole it from nationalparks.org, but kind of the rundown as to why that works. Um, the third one is beautifully and terrifying, which is that volcanoes can actually create their own lightning. Um, the fourth one is um, this, observation that scientists have made that um, alligators will actually yield to manatees when they encounter each other in the wild, which if you've ever seen a manatee and then also an alligator is bizarre, but there you have it. Um, perhaps the alligators are like on a low fat diet. Um, they're all doing like paleo. Um, and then the fifth one, for those of you who like to like locate things within your body is, is just kind of having you think about your kidneys and how they're lopsided um, if you have both kidneys. So um, yeah, um, choose one, see where it goes. Um, and let's, you know, start work on a poem or, you know, just maybe an essay, a flash creative nonfiction piece, um, and just locate the fact kind of at the heart of it. But then, you know, from there, whatever you want to do, if you want to, you know, read more about these things, you know, um, go ahead, go wild, do some, some other research. Um, and like I said, my only guideline is, you know, don't, don't totally subvert the science, keep it there. Um, one of the things that the various speakers in these poems and pieces do, especially the one we just looked at is, you know, when they don't know something, they kind of say a thing and then they're like, I don't know what that means. You know, like she keeps going. So, you know, if you, if you get really hung up, I'm, I'm less concerned with like whether or not your poem is true and much more about like where you as a speaker are interested in that, in that poem. Um, and yeah, if you get stuck, just flip back through this packet. Good writers borrow techniques. Great writers, of course, steal them. So, you know, steal inspiration from these. So let's come back. I want to give you a big chunk of time. Let's come back at, at quarter two, just so we can kind of see where we all go with this. Um, but yeah, I'm going to take a seat and write with you. And uh, yeah, let's do it. Um, I would love to maybe, if we could just talk about where you went with it. And if you want to read a couple of lines, I'd love to hear them. But um, I started writing a terrible poem about a kidney. So it's OK if maybe this wasn't like, <laughs> maybe, you know, uh, hopefully your experience was better. I think I got stuck because I was like, I actually don't know that much about the kidney. Um, so do as I say, not as I do. Um, do you mind starting us off? What did you, what were you start inspired by? Or where, where did you go? Um, I went for the kidneys. You did? <laughs> just punch right in that lower back. Yeah. yeah. You want to read a couple lines or if, um, if it's short or you can just, if you want to just maybe, yeah, I would love to hear it. Symmetry, like the slick curls in a lying mouth, isn't natural. My kidneys, both hospitalized for infection once, are not symmetrical. The clitoris, an organ, only mapped fully by a female doctor in 2005, isn't symmetrical. I didn't know. 
no one taught me. Maybe no one taught them. Maybe no one taught anyone, so no one learned anything. And our stumbling is the only symmetry that comes naturally. That is awesome. Yeah, that is really cool. You want to follow that up? <laughs> you will, though. You're a sport. Um, what was your What was your thing? I went for the alligator manatee. Okay. Booping. Okay, the booping. Yeah. That's a scientific term, right there. It is actually yeah. a scientific term. It's, it's precious to think about. And I kind of started a little bit of a, a lyric essay, as you know I do. Um, you want to read a couple lines, or maybe just talk about where where it started going? Like, what what was it about the alligators and manatees specifically? I was kind of really focused on like the imagery of like this soft little squishy creature like a manatee convincing an alligator to move just by going, no, I'm here. And the alligator going, yeah, okay, I'll move for you. It's like they're just too precious. And I thought it was going to be about when I was living in Florida and encountering many sharp, dangerous surfaces on soft, squishy me, but it ended up being about my dog instead. So. Mm -hmm. I love, but again, you know, like that's where it can take you, right? Yeah. Yeah. What was, what spoke to you? Um, <clears throat> I walked on the kidney. The kidney as well? Yeah. yeah. What was it, or you have a line or something we could hear? Yeah. <coughs> um, I'm just going to be short. I said, being right, being right is about positioning, or about speaking the truth. I'm right, I'm right, or oh, I'm the right place. I'll do the But when we refer to something being wrong, we don't say I'm left. We rather say it's in south. The only other time we use left is the past tense of leave. Can English be more straightforward? Maybe the language is not placed in the right. Maybe it's like the left being shaped kidney who chose to be behind the miniature skin so it can have plenty of room to sprawl with different words and turn our heads left and right at will. What if English is like the right kidney, who happens to be smaller than its larger, larger than my twin, because, it, because it's under pressure from the liver of north? Then the language wouldn't have the audacity to turn our heads, the name of being creative. In the end, I can write this because I appreciate the audacity, or rather, I have the audacity. I love that. It became this meditation on the etymology of language. Yeah. The kidneys were speaking to folks today. I love this. Because, uh, yeah. All right, cool. Uh, my name is Brother Bertrand. Uh, kidneys for me uh, equal in your ability to function, though lopsided by circumstances, giving more room for growth to one and less to the other. There is no bad blood between them, no room for jealousy. They've got enough toxicity to deal with, and they know they have enough room for them. Did you say they have no room for jealousy? No, no, yeah. Yeah, that is a cool line. Uh, yeah. Uh, Amy, did you? Well, I, kidney? I, I did not pick a kidney. No. I picked the Nancy and um, the alligator. Okay. But mine is definitely not like that, so I'm not going to share. But it, I started to think about being a mom with a child who has um, cerebral palsy and all the things I had to do to butt through the insurance and school and everything else to get to where he is today. And it's like I had to move those alligators, but I pictured as my obstacle out of the way. And just by knowing that I had a plan, that was me. Moving them out. Mm, I love that. Is how I'm going with yeah, it. no, I love that. I love it. I'll go across the aisle. Yeah. So I'm, I'm sort of intrigued about um, uh, the absence of descriptions of the color blue. Okay. Yeah. So uh, the title is blue. Sky, ceiling to all the known world, that brightens each dawn, fades to black from sight. Those stars like candles in the blanket of night. But gone at first light, those cotton puffs that float by, what of this neglected negative space? Sky. It's like no other vista I see, not green, not brown, or red, 
clearly not white, yet more than gray. What is this soothing tone spread as far as I can see? I inhale its splendor, then free it. What wonder was it I blew? Oh, I love that at the end. Clever. Yeah, good. What about you? I picked the rocks. You went for the rocks. I went for the rocks. All right. A force, force of nature. Stubborn, he said. Nothing can make you move until you want to. Is it stubbornness? Or waiting for the universe to conspire, throwing its elements of nature in just the right combination to shift my mindset and move the immovable, like the rocks of racetrack flying. Nice. I love that. It's like, we always, oh, well, now I'm thinking of that terrible song. He is a rock, but it's like, no, stubborn as a rock. Like, I'm here. I was here first. And Hannah, last but never least. Oh, I also picked blue. I know we're shocked. Um, <laughs> and mine kind of turned into a, a play on a piece I'd written in one of your other, in a course I took with you about writing on the color blue. Um, I have one of those degrees that no one ever knows what to make of or how to pronounce or what kind of job to offer me unless they do. In which case, the latter is already decided, and the former is on your wall telling you how to do the second. Linguists figured out that we didn't see, or write for others to see, blue until 4,500 years ago, millennia without Prussian and cerulean and navy and indigo, and it took the tools of a wordsmith to unearth. I sat in poetry class four to five years ago, and writing about hard feelings and sloths and Neil Armstrong's pants, but more on that later, because history, I think, knew knows that poets would need material to keep humanity afloat, a level of levity in an otherwise dire strait. Wine dark, the color of the sea until we discovered that light refracts and bends to make blue, and until we knew that phonemes could do the same. And it continues talking. Awesome. I like the, the, the list you had. Someone had like the big box of Crayolas growing up. Um, show off. No, just kidding. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And then like the crummy metallic ones that like looked really cool in the box. It doesn't matter. Uh, <laughs> um, so this was really awesome. And I, I thank you all for being here and, and being like so willing um, to talk about writing, especially on, on a Saturday um, when we could all be doing other things. Um, but then also this is like the most important thing, no big deal. Um, so I hope a couple things that you get to take with you. Um, I just had a couple of resources. There's a website, iflscience.com. I bleeping love science.com. Um, that's where some of these cool things come from, um, and they're on social media. So add them to your Instagram feed in between all the other things you're looking at. Um, I just suggest if you ever want to Google nature is scary, it can get a little gory, um, but some really cool stuff comes up. Um, I am. Slate has some really interesting things every once in a while. Um, there's an article there that actually one of the paleontologists that I met at the conference discovered um, in 2020 that uh, basically he discovered the, the cloaca that dinosaurs had. Um, it's really similar to a chicken. Um, so yeah, uh, there's a poem in there somewhere. Um, if you're willing to go wade into Reddit, um, Subreddits like educational or nature's metal um, can really put up some cool things. And then finally, um, I'm a big fan of the website Atlas Obscura, which is based in geography, but there's a bunch of cool places. So you have all been so lovely, and I thank you for your time. Um, I've got a couple of books. If you would like one, I'm more than happy to give them. They can be your souvenir of our time together today. But uh, otherwise, you were great. Thank you so much. I will clap. Yeah. Thank, you. And thank you again for joining us and thank you Christina for taking time out of your schedule to come up and be with us today and we hope that you join us for other activities that we have here at the library. Yeah. Thank you again. Yeah, thank you.